We are very blessed today to have Dr. Rubel Shelley with us as our guest speaker. He is the president of Rochester College in Michigan, has been in that role for several years now. It's a, it's a beautiful campus, a wonderful group of young people meeting there in Michigan. He was with us this weekend for our SALT conference, our Sharing and Learning Together conference, and our theme was Life Together. And it was a wonderful morning yesterday, and he's uh, graciously agreed to stay over this morning and preach for us at both services. And so we're, we're grateful for that, and we won't, don't want to take any more of his time. So let's welcome Rubel Shelley. The honor is mine to get to be with you. I've known of the Preston Crest Church for years through friendship, close friendship with Prentice, his sister, a member of the church that I served for 27 years in Nashville, knowing Prentice and Barbara and working with them in various settings, and knowing of you, as Paul said of various churches to whom he wrote and where he'd never been. He said, I know your reputation. I know you from afar. I appreciate this church, and what an honor to get to be with you. And if any of you did stand out in the rain and, you know, do this and taste of it, that was Michigan. I brought this rain to you, and it's not necessary for you to stand and applaud. Just we, We've had drought in Michigan this summer as well, lost some cherry crops and blueberry crops and other terrible things and corn crops. So we, we understand with you, and uh, we've gotten the break just a few weeks ago, and now you. Glad to do it for you. <laughs> I suppose every Christian has a song or a hymn that she would say is her favorite. That there is some lyric that someone has written somewhere back there that's so summarizes, so compresses for him the preciousness of his faith that he says, ah, that one just means something special. I have such a favorite one that probably ranks reasonably high on your list of hymns that are favorites. It could be your favorite. It's written by an old slaver whose heart God captured and who turned from trading in human flesh and bringing slaves from Africa to the New World to wanting to tell people about Jesus Christ and the redemption that he had found in the blood of Christ from all the evils that he had inflicted upon other humans. And so somewhere in the mid-1700s, John Newton wrote, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. I suppose we call grace amazing precisely because it flies in the face of logic and common sense. I have enough common sense to know that I cannot claim standing before a holy God. God in His infinite perfection from eternity past, Christ Jesus, God incarnate, coming and being tempted in all the ways I am, but never yielding to one of those temptations. How dare I claim the right to come before that God? How dare I claim a status equal to that of the incarnate Christ? My, my reading of the Bible turns up commandments. Commandments that are holy because they reflect God's nature. Commandments that I'm obligated to obey because as I obey them, I honor God, I, I acknowledge God, I, I surrender to His reign in my life. But I'll be honest with you. I'm not even sure I understand all of them, much less how some of them relate to others of them, and I certainly can't claim to have been obedient even to all of those that are so clear that even I couldn't misunderstand. Even if 
I were to make the claim. But I've done better than some people I know with those commandments. I'd still be tripped up by this verse out of James 2. Even if somebody keeps the whole law and offends in one point, he's as guilty as if he'd broken all the commandments. You read that and you try to make sense of it. I, I, I think in pictures, I think of it this way. I'm suspended from some tower by a, a strong chain of a thousand links. How many of those links would have to break for me to plunge to my destruction? If I really thought that my hope of a connection with God was, was my obedience, my ability to understand and then to obey those commandments, James says, but if there's just one that trips you up, Rubel, it's, it's as if you broke them all. You failed. Oh, and I know a little bit about logic. I've had formal training in Aristotelian and symbolic leg- uh, logic at the doctoral level. I, I've taught logic at four different colleges and universities. I, say, I know a little bit about it. Well, the logic of the thing is pretty clear. I only know of one unerring propositional truth that I could generate from Scripture that's relevant to the subject at hand. I've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the penalty I deserve is spiritual death, to be separated from God from all eternity because in His holiness, someone who is sinful has no right to stand in His presence. Common sense tells all of us we're too flawed to withstand the gaze of a holy God. Our logic tells us there is no way that we we claim as a right a relationship with God. And yet in Scripture, we are told if you're in Christ, there is no condemnation to you. We're told nothing in all of creation would be powerful enough to separate you from the love of God that has come to you through Christ Jesus. And so against everything we know from common sense and logic, we dare come together on this beautiful rainy Sunday and celebrate the fact that we have a relationship with a holy God that is rock solid. We are not under condemnation. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ. And so we sing amazing logic, how clear the major and minor premises and how unquestioning the conclusion. No, we don't. (laughs) We sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saves wretches like us. The gospel is the message that pierces the darkness of what we know about the human condition and about our own hearts. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not through what you've done, lest anybody should boast before God. That's Paul out of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ah, Paul knew this business about grace. Paul said, you want to know the truth about me, it is that I'm the chief of sinners. Others would say Paul was wrong there and volunteer themselves to be chief of sinners, but actually anybody who understands how serious sin is comes down where Paul did. If I'm not the chief of sinners, I'm at least serious enough a sinner that there's no hope for me as me. But here's the man who's admittedly chief of sinners in his own eyes, but able to say, but I'm not under condemnation. I am so loved by God that because of Christ, nothing could ever separate me from Him. And I have been justified by God's grace through my faith in that Christ, not through what I've done 
I haven't fixed all the things that I did wrong. God has reached to me by His goodness. And that too-good-to-be-true message that we call the gospel nullifies the common-sense inference that we make about our spiritual status. Because though we know we are sinners, we know that if we know Christ, ah, and there are two different senses of knowing. I know these things intellectually, but because I know, because I have a relationship with Christ, He's willing to look past that and to save me. Where sin increased, Paul writes in another place, Romans 5, grace increased all the more so that just as sin reigned in death, so grace now might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. From the Word of God, we have indeed learned from the law that we're a lot worse off than we ever wanted to admit we were. But from that same inspired text, we are learning and coming to believe that we are loved far more than we dare to dream. Someone put it this way, the essential message of the gospel is there is more grace in God's heart than there is sin in your past. Or in the words of another, all biblical theology can be summed up in two sentences. Sentence number one, let's face it, we're a lot worse off than we ever thought we were. Sentence number two, but cheer up, God's grace is a lot bigger than we ever thought it could be. Repentance should come so easy to us. And I think repentance does come fairly easy to most of us when we get to the point in life that we see ourselves clearly at all. Oh, when we are so immature that we hardly see the difference between right and wrong, or when we see the difference, we only see the sweet candy surround that Satan has put on all the wrong things to lure us in that direction. The glitz and the glamour and the lights and the tinkling bells... But you don't have to get very old or terribly mature about a lot of other things to realize, whoa, that's a sucker punch. The sweet candy coating, the lights and the tinkling bells just lure me in that direction so I can be trapped. Addiction. We're learning a lot about addiction in our culture these days. Addiction in our culture is the language of what the Bible calls sin. All sin is addicting. Jesus said in John 8, 44, sin is what enslaves us. People who've had experience with addictions, they understand this business about how enticing and yet what a trap sin can be. And whether it's to money, with greed, gambling, to persons, through just the sensations, the, the titillations, the sexual attractions, sexual addictions, or chemicals, the highs, the lows that chemicals can induce, the addictions of drugs and alcohol. You don't go very far down those extremes or, or down those paths, even if you've gone to such an extreme that you now are addicted to some of them and you can't get back on your own. But you've changed your mind about it. It's not fun anymore. It's killing you. It's not attractive anymore. You weep over it. It has cost you jobs, relationships, Dignity, self-respect, repentance comes pretty easy. The hard part's faith. The faith to believe that God, knowing where you've been and what you've done and the frequency and the depths of it, that anybody could still love you enough that they'd take you back want to have anything to do with you after that. 
I have a close personal friend. I'll call her Judy for the purpose of telling her story to you. It's a story that she tells publicly. I'm not breaking any confidence. Judy was a drug addict and a prostitute for 17 years. Judy worked through three men as husbands, and she doesn't know how many, just as tricks and one-nighters. That there weren't any chemicals coming onto the streets that she didn't try, not so much at this point for the kick, the high, as the release, just to blot the memory, to... And Christ tracked her down. And when she heard the gospel, Judy had no problem repenting. She'd been repenting for years now. She had long since changed her mind about what fun is and what the good life looks like. And She said, it's sort of like the idiocy of thinking you stick your nose in a meat slicer and say, ain't this fun? Repentance wasn't Judy's problem. Judy said, nobody, not even God, could love me enough. But after all the baggage I'm bringing, he could forgive it. That's where the word grace comes in. The typical definition we give, I think, is right on target. Unmerited favor. Judy, it's favor, it's blessing, it's acceptance, it's pardon, it's healing, it's the breaking of addictions, it's the reestablishing now of healthy relationships. Do you deserve that after all you've done? But God's favor, God's grace. Judy would tell you, I believe every part of the Bible except one. Paul's not the chief of sinners. I'm the chief of sinners. No, Judy, even for you or Paul, you debate that when you get to heaven with him as to who really was chief. Grace says, God's big enough to handle not one or the other of you, but both of you and all the rest of us too. But let me ask you to think about it this way, and this is the way that finally got through to Judy. Judy, let's think of sin this way. I think you think of sin because you've been taught to I broke a rule. I violated a law. I've broken and violated and been on the wrong side of, and I've just stacked up such a long list. Well, Judy, that is sin. But actually, sin's even more serious than that. Sin is less breaking rules and laws than it's breaking God's heart. So suppose somebody breaks a law. Let's let it be insider trading on Wall Street. Let's let it be selling drugs. Let's let it be murder. What does law do? Well, perhaps law discovers and exposes and arrests and tries and convicts and punishes. But at some point, what do we say under law? He served 12 years. She served 20. He's paid his debt to society. And he's released. Judy, sin really isn't that way. We can't pay our own debt. Let's not let it be insider trading or selling drugs or even murder. Let's let it be 
killing a child. Maybe it's an accident. Maybe a tire blows out, or maybe you were drinking and lost control of a car and it jumps a curb and a child is playing innocently in a front yard on a tricycle and that little three-year-old child has life snuffed out of him in an instant. Have you broken some rules? Will there be the police to show up? Will there possibly be criminal charges? Could there be jailed? Yes, but at some point, will you have paid your debt to society? Well, I guess. But what about the mother of that child? All the police investigations and the charges and all the humiliation of a court, the fines paid and the years served, nothing can make right with this mother. The fact that her child has been taken and I did it. If anything is ever put right between that woman and that careless driver, drunk driver, molester, murderer, it'll be by something that common sense and logic can't account for. It'll have nothing to do with the debts paid. It'll have to do with the fact that somewhere from down in the depths of her being, that woman finds a way to do the most audacious, outrageous thing that is imaginable, and that some of you sitting there are saying, I'm not sure I ever could. I don't know that I could either. Ah, but you see, that is what God does when He forgives us. The law is broken. And it's not that we pay the debt. It's that God steps in and does the most outrageous thing. He takes the guilt of that on Himself and at the cross allows the full force of judgment and wrath, rage and outrage that we feel because of sin to all pour out into his own lap. And then he says, and now I want to be your friend. Brian Chappell tells a particular version of an old tale about a man who died and went to heaven and at the portico, the gate of heaven, he, he meets Gabriel. And Gabriel is there with the notepad, and he's checking admission, and he's explaining the gate protocols. And he tells him, in order to get into heaven, you have to accumulate 100 points. Let's get started. Let's investigate your life. The guy's a little bit stunned, and he thinks about 100 points, and he doesn't know the scale. So Gabriel says, tell me the most impressive, positive thing about your life that you believe merits some points on my scale. First thing, he says, I was married to this woman for over 50 years. She was a wonderful woman. We had three lovely children. We reared them to know Christ. They're serving faithfully in the church. I, 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 was, I, I was a deacon eventually. I, I became an elder in the church. Never gave less than a tithe. And, and not only was I faithful to my wife during those 15 years that we were doing that with our children... I never even thought about another, never looked at another woman with an evil thought. Gabriel said, hm, that's wonderful. That ought to be worth three. <laughs> the guy sweats a bit and he, he says, well, well, I... We, we, we built a shelter for homeless people and, and, and during certain situations, oh, we, we'd feed hundreds of people. And Gabriel says, that's... That's fantastic. One more. And so on through two or three other things. And now the guy's not just sweating. He says, Gabriel, this is never going to work. I, I, I'll never be... This is hopeless. I'm hopeless. All I'm going to be able to do is throw myself in the mercy of God's court and plead His grace. And Gabriel says, Ah, come right on in. 
I know the heart of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. You're welcome here. Grace, amazing grace. It's ours to receive, church, but understand, we're supposed to be the arbiters of it to the folks who don't know it yet. They need to see us treating each other with grace. They need to see us reacting to them, not with anger and rage and judgment and railing, but with grace. They need to come to understand God's heart because they are getting to know some of God's people. They see the Father's DNA in us. They see little Jesuses in the Preston Crest Church. They get to know people who are so filled with the Spirit of God that they react to people and situations not by common sense, not by logic, not by rage, not by wrath, not with judgment, but with a message of hope and light and truth that allows them not to be defensive, but to acknowledge their repentance and then for us to help them believe that God is greater. God is greater than their sin. Heaven knew what humans could not accept. Our lostness was so profound, our pride so great, we want to fix it. Our alienation from God so unbridgeable that God knew His purpose to have fellowship with us. He created us to be in relationship with us. He was determined that He would not have that purpose defeated. And so he acted with extravagance to do something fantastic, something utterly outlandish. He didn't merely take human form, but he became a fully human being, God with us, tempted in all the ways we are, betrayed, abused, abandoned, and then presented himself at the altar of sacrifice, both as the great high priest and as the once-for-all sacrifice to do what we could not that the one person who has honored all the righteous demands of law, under whose demands I deserve to die, he dies the death I was due to die that we might have the life only he deserves in eternal fellowship with the Father and the Spirit and himself. So what do we do? We have confessed Jesus with our lips that we believe in Him. And we have confessed Him in our baptism. We have reenacted and embraced for ourselves His death, His burial, His resurrection as our only hope that we really believe that what He did was adequate for all we need. And at the table he hosts, we come frequently and we take bread and we take wine and we confess it all over again. Our very lives become living sacrifices. The medium of grace to other people, acknowledging God's free gift. Any room for boasting here? Us sticking out our chest about what we did and how we fixed the mess we once were? No. Only praise to the Lord for His grace. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul.